everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for round two of our Facebook live chats on the RareX Home Assistant Areas Data Collection Program. Um, I'm joined today again with Liz Carter and um, Brittany Park. We're going to quickly introduce ourselves and uh, we'll quickly recap our whys and Brittany will give a little bit more of a why. And then we're going to talk about health and development um, with the Home Assistant Areas. So um, again, my name is Danae Barkey. I'm the Executive Director of HC Network America. Um, my brother and I were late diagnosed patients. Um, I was 10, he was five. I was asymptomatic at the time. Garrett was not, he was very delayed in his milestones. And now as an adult patient, um, I have a lot of questions about what my future looks like because it's pretty uncertain according to the literature because there is no literature for uh, patients my age and also patients who have had children. So we're, we're in unmarked territory. Um, Liz, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Liz Carter and my son Elliot is now six years old and he has classical HCU. Um, Elliot was missed at newborn screening and was diagnosed at age two and a half after suffering a series of health setbacks um, due to his undiagnosed HCU. So um, I, I guess we're going to get in again to our, our kind of reason behind our joining and participating in the RareX program. Um, it's really a couple different things for me personally. Um, number one, you know, I know probably all of our ultimate goal is to have a treatment and hopefully one day a cure for HCU. So, um, you know, I kind of see this opportunity as an, a chance to share information that could potentially allow researchers to connect a lot of dots and put together puzzle pieces that, you know, we all know <laughs> exist and are part of our daily lives, but maybe just need to be seen and you know, have someone step back and look at a big picture of things. Um, my other other thing I didn't mention on our previous video, but I've kind of alluded to is that Elliot was missed at newborn screening. And we know, I think it's something like 50%, Danae, correct me if I'm wrong, of babies that are potentially missed at newborn screening with HCU. And so, you know, this could be another opportunity to, um, to allow us to see the impacts too that um, being missed at newborn screening might have on someone versus their outcome at, you know, if they're caught at screening. So just a good opportunity to hammer home the importance of that. Yes, great. Um, I'm, my name is Brittany Park and our family um, lives in just outside Denver, Colorado. We have four kids. Two of our boys have been diagnosed with homocystinuria cobalamin G. So that's um, a defect in the metabolism of cobalamin. Very, very similar to classical homocystinuria, just a, a little bit of a separate part of the biochemical pathway. Um, and I am very grateful to be able to be here today to talk about RareX. We were excited to be a part of it. Um, I uh, am privileged to serve on the board for the Homocystinuria Network of America, and I also lead the Cabalamine Steering Committee, where we can, we have been working on lots of great projects and publishing um, lots of great patient resources for families um, with that diagnosis. And as for my why, um, why do I want to participate in the RareX program for my boys? Um, in 2011, uh, my husband and I were expecting our second child, our first little boy, and he was born healthy and um, lovely, great little boy. We started to notice some concerns about his development early on, and we're getting dismissed frequently um, by our pediatricians. Um, until around two months, he suffered a serious seizure and um, was taken by ambulance to the hospital. Um, he, many misdiagnoses later, he was put on a ventilator and we found out that he did have homocystinuria, cobalamin defect, but they didn't know which one. We began treating and the treatments worked well, but so much damage had occurred that it ultimately did result on his passing um, at just three and a half months old. And that grief is something that my husband and I would hope no other parent would have to go through when there's treatments and we know how um, 
how to help kids lead a good life. Um, so now fast forward uh, quite a number of years and our last baby Grayson is now three. Um, and he also was diagnosed at birth because we knew of our uh, carrier status for this disorder was born with it and began treatment at 24 um, hours old. He's doing fantastic. He's currently in preschool today. <laughs> That's why it's finally quiet at my house. And he um, he's doing great. He has some mild speech delays, but other than that, he is thriving and a happy and wonderful little boy. And so my why is, is just like Liz, I, I advocate for newborn screening because if newborn screening had faith of our son Drew, he would still be with us today. I advocate for other families for, for better treatments for my son and we can do that all through this data collection program. And that's a great way that we can tie in our patient community because we're spread out all over the world and there's um, not very many of us. And so when we can come together as a community and build this data program together, we just have a better opportunity to have research and um, doctors connected and our kids can have a better future. So that is my why. And I'm, I'm, I love being a part of this program. Excellent. I think your family story is a huge testament as to the power that newborn screening has on families and patients and the amazing outcomes. It's just, it's been amazing to watch Grayson um, thrive, quite honestly. It's, it's amazing. Um, well, we're going to jump in here to um, the health and development survey. And so I'm going to just give a precursor that it's going to like the, the share that I have are for our first share, it looks a little bit overwhelming, but it's not. And so the first share that I have, I'm going to quickly pull it up here, is um, a list of all the surveys. It's one survey, all the data points here in the health and development survey. And so that, oh, okay. <laughs> since I said you raised your hand, Brittany, I was like, did I screw something up? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so the Health and Development Survey is a series of yes, no, unsure questions. It's that simple. And so it looks like a lot of different areas that they're asking about, but it's really not. It, this is this goes through pretty quick, um, in my opinion. Um, and so you just kind of start at the top and you go through and it's like, and it will, it will give you more information as to like what things they're specific to, like specific things to the nervous system or specific things to growth. Um, this was just so I could fit it all on one slide. Um, I know for myself, as I was clicking through, like I, I knew what areas I had some, I've had issues with personally. Um, but there were things that I would have never even thought to connect. Um, and so then I just kind of got my, I did like that, uh, not really sure how do I answer this. Um, and so, but one of the things that this does do is if you click yes, it opens additional surveys in the, uh, in your dashboard. And so after you complete the survey, you'll see a bunch more stuff <laughs> pop up. And so um, the more that, resonates with you, the more um, that will allow you to open up with. And this is a survey that you, they do ask that you do go and um, go back to on a yearly basis, because unfortunately, we do grow and evolve, um, which isn't necessarily an unfortunate thing, but sometimes our symptoms evolve too. And so things that we don't experience at one point, we might experience at another point in time. So this allows you to kind of track your progression also with um, different symptoms that may or may not be related. Um, but even if they have not been directly related to home assistant or still account for them because we might find there are other patients um, that are experiencing these same things that just haven't been noted in the literature. Um, Liz or Brittany, were there things that were surprising for you guys when you um, walked through the, the survey? I was, I was just, like you said, Danae, there's so many things that as a parent I feel is connected to his, his disorder, but that because we don't have 
a good understanding, especially long-term, how it affects the body, um, our doctors kind of don't know. And it's kind of like, I don't know, let's wait and see. And one thing that I really found interesting was the sleeping, right? And I, um, I always just thought Grayson was just a terrible sleeper. And I had like lost the lottery when it came to him ever being through the night. <laughs> um, but, you know, it got me thinking and I was like, I wonder if this really is, is something other families have experienced. And I kind of went, went to my network of people, my, the other moms and that we know that have cobalamin G or another cobalamin disorder. And I said, Hey, do your kids sleep well? And the answer was no, they're terrible sleepers. And it, it just is amazing how you, um, how some of these things are, are so connected. I mean, we have to remember that homelessness scenario, this process occurs in every single cell of our body. And so it makes sense that it would affect multiple systems of our body. And this is such a great way for us to look at everything as a whole and really understand, you know, what is going on in the bodies of our, of our little ones, you know, cause they can't always tell us what's going on. So I was, I was glad to be able to have that part of it. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> as ahead. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, Danae, um, you know, as, a newer parent, like Brittany mentioned, um, bringing questions to her pediatrician when her baby was really young. I remember doing that uh, with Elliot, with his pediatrician. There were just little things I was picking up on that I just felt something wasn't right. Um, and I say, is he developing at the right rate? Is his speech moving along like it should? And I, the pediatrician would just reassure me, yeah, mom, he's, he's good. Um, because he wasn't super, super delayed or super behind. But I just had this sense that there was something that was off. And, you know, obviously in retrospect, now that I look back, yeah, there was something off. Um, but, you know, there's just like Brittany also said, there's not that much out there in terms of research. Um, and we all know that, you know, as much as we want doctors to be the expert on everything, they're simply not. Um, and so, I, you know, I think back if, you know, I had been able to kind of put the puzzle pieces together myself. I may have, you know, we may have come up with something sooner, but, you know, just it's, it is interesting how many little things that I noticed that this survey did ask me about. And it does make me wonder, you know, are they directly connected? One like little example that, you know, a lot of kids have is eczema. Um, Elliot's always had eczema. And, you know, how is that connected with HCU or is it? I don't know, but I've talked to other parents whose kids have HCU and several other of them have indicated that their kids have eczema. So it just, it makes you wonder, um, but there's just, there is a lot out there that, that I realized through the survey is potentially, you know, significant. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you said, doctors, they don't know everything. Like they're just people like us. Right. And, but they want to know, like, I really do think like, you know, I've talked to Grayson's metabolic team at Colorado Children's and they're phenomenal. We love them, but it's impossible for them to know everything. Right. And our population is so small. That's what I love about this program because it can help our doctors because they can, it can pull up this information and it's, it doesn't have any identifying um, information about your child on it. It just has the data, the raw data they need to be able to say, you know, to answer our questions. So if someone comes in and says, my son won't sleep, like, or he has really bad eczema, or, you know, he's not talking like he should, the doctor can say, you know, yeah, we have seen that in some kids with this disorder. And it's just so empowering to be able to feel like your, your concerns are heard and your doctor can help you on that path to discover what is going on and how to help your child. Because ultimately that's like, that's the common goal. We all just want to help our child and help them um, have a successful life. And so I think it just allows for that. And you don't think like just filling out these surveys, how can that really be helpful? But, but honestly, it is, it's empowering for both you know, you as a parent, because you are actively supporting the collection of our community and our doctors and researchers coming to get this data, it's, it's empowering everybody to be able to treat our patients better. Yeah. Um, I think what I will do is I want to stop sharing this picture 
and then share the other. There's another one, and I think this kind of, sorry, it's always a question of where, whoops, um, that's the wrong, wrong share button here. Um, but this is just an idea of, uh, did that, it didn't share, sorry. I'm used to things like, and it paused it. Technology, it's a, <laughs> it crashed. Um, so let me reopen that and I apologize. Um, that is very bizarre. Um, we're having some technical difficulties here, but I have it open. Um, so I just I'm gonna take a second here. But when we think about certain parts of home assistant area, we like to, you know, we, we know in a lot of cases it affects the eyes. We know that it affects the nervous system and we know that it affects the heart. And since there's so many different types of home assistant area, it's hard to kind of lump them all together. Um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting is um, I was talking to Brittany the other night and um, I'm gonna move this over here so before I, I do that so it doesn't crash things. Um, but I was talking to, to her and she was reviewing this research map we're working on for the cobalamin disorders. And, you know, we only hear as patients and caregivers, did, did that share with you guys, Brittany and uh, yep, yep, yeah. I want to make sure. Um, so, you know, we, we hear about these common things, but we don't necessarily hear about all the things because, you know, there, there are a lot of things. And so when Brittany <laughs> shared this, this slide, essentially, the other night, I was kind of taken aback because I was like, whoa, there is a lot more things than what we are being, what we have been shared. And so it is, and this is all stuff that is well documented in the literature, but I don't think families necessarily know. Um, and maybe some of it isn't as well documented, actually. Some of it is more like, we have evidence for, but it's just, you know, because it is such a small community, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And so um, I thought it was really important because this is what the Rare Acts Data Collection Program allows us to capture, these things plus more. So if these are the things that we know of, think about how many more things we could be experiencing um, that we just haven't uncovered yet. Um, especially like Brittany said, you know, we, we don't know what's going on with the little ones because they can't really verbalize things. So unless if they're having outward symptoms, you may never actually know some of these other things. Um, and especially depending on where you are at in the world, um, access to your access to care, certain types of testing might not be available. Um, so this is this was for the cobalamin disorders and severe MTHFR. Um, I don't have anything like this for classical home assistant, but I am definitely wondering what other things are <laughs> are out there. I know uh, Liz and I have had conversations um, just even about uh, sensory issues because she had asked something about her little guy. Well, not so little anymore, but little still. Um, and uh, and I was like, yeah, I have all those things. Like we. My, I, I didn't wear socks till I was, you know, completely teased and harassed in middle school. Um, and so it's like, you know, there, there are other things that I think that happen within the community that, you know, just that, that that's not an eye issue. That's not a, ner a nervous system issue. That's not a heart issue. It, it doesn't, and it's not a bone issue. It doesn't fit into those like four categories that we've been so focused on for so long. So unless if we share out those. Yeah, a lot of times it's, it's the unseen, that, and that's just as important sometimes as the seen, right? I mean, you know, and again, we don't know if it's a little one, what they're experiencing, if they can't articulate it, but like brain fog, yeah. um, having trouble at school, behavioral stuff. Is it behavioral? We don't know, you know? I mean, there's so many unseen things too that, uh, that are probably going on that we could learn a lot from if we, you know, were able to share that in one space. And also, this is just a way to kind of promote health equity too, right? Because depending on where you live or if you have access to, you know, or what level of care you have access to, this is a way for providers everywhere to, to be able to access more information, right? Because a lot of times too, just 
depending on your provider. What he or she knows about homeless scenarios specifically may be very limited. So that's just another way our participation in the program could help, you know, just making sure that as many providers that we get this information into the hands of as many providers as we can so that everybody, no matter where you live, has a provider that has access to, to good information. Absolutely. <clears throat> so like today was saying, when I was compiling this disease manifestation list that she had pulled up, uh, it was scary, right? Like all those things on there are big, big deals. And um, the hardest part is, is we don't, we don't know enough, right? Like these things are happening. We know they're happening, but why are they happening? And what part of the pathway, you know, is it the elevated homocysteine? Is it decreased methionine? These are all things that we, we need to understand better. And the only way that we can understand it and get that, that list more defined to understand where things are occurring and how we can help fix it is this data program. Um, you know, part of this research map that I have been working on has been interviewing top researchers and clinical um, physicians in the world. And it's been phenomenal to meet with all of these individuals. And one of the questions I ask is, what are the unmet needs of our community? And every single one of them, it kind of blows me away. You know, every single one of them is, we need you need a way as a patient community to pull in your patients together so that we can we can collect that data, right? Like we, and um, and I've been able to share with them our RareX platform and it launching and um, and they've all been very excited about it because this is something where you know there's we're spread out globally, right? We're we're all over the place. We see different metabolic specialists and they have different levels of experience with these disorders, and so. The exciting part is this RareX platform can allow these pediatricians, even in Switzerland or France, to access access this data that is going to help going to help their patients, and then in turn putting all their information in about you know encouraging their patients to to add their data. And the more data we have, the better understanding we have of this the, of this disorder. And um, I just I found it so interesting that that was one of the top things all of these researchers and doctors were saying is we need to unite this community. We need to get better data. We need better disease understanding. You know, I was really hoping they would say, you know, we need, you, you know, you want a cure, right? You want to find something that just is that the, the golden ticket. But for right now, what we need to get towards that goal is to unite our community together through this RareX platform. And it's just a great, a great place to, to unite as a community. So. That leaves on actually ends on a, a pretty good note here because our next one is kind of um, our next picture, I should say, um, here is, you know, last week when we um, did our event, we had eight families enrolled or eight patients enrolled in the data collection program. And since then, uh, do I have two things open? I must. So um, <laughs> like, which one am I sharing? So we are now up to 16 uh, participants. Um, and so we have doubled our numbers, which is great, but we have a little bit of a ways to go. And so we need families to take action. We need patients to take action. It does not matter where you are in the globe. You can be in the U.S., you can be in Europe, you can be in South America. If you can read English, you can participate. Um, and there's probably ways around that. Um, and so um, we, we really need the community, like Brittany said, tonight to make this really a, a true perspective of what it's like to live with the homocystine areas. And it is open to classical homocystine area, any of the cobalamin disorders with uh, high homocysteine and severe MTHFR. So lots of room for everyone to participate despite what type of homocysteine area or despite where you are at in the globe. Um, and then I have one more slide here to share. I have to stop and switch slides. As they mentioned last week, those first, I don't know how many we said that participate, 
you get yes. one of these really sweet own it shirts, which I might say are very comfortable, great color. Like just if you want to uh, obtain one of these awesome shirts um, from Rare X, uh, I think Danae has a handful to send out. Do you still have any left today? Yeah, I have a few left. So um, what we'll need you to do in order to get one is just to screenshot your dashboard. Um, I'm not looking for your answers. I'm just looking that the dashboard is there and has been set up. We, we need to know that people are going in and setting those up. Um, and, you know, just you can private message us on Facebook. You can email it to us or you can put it on Facebook in one of the Facebook groups. And if, if you feel comfortable doing so and um, just just tag one of us and uh, that will help us know that it's been done um, and we'll get you that shirt um, sent out to you. So this was kind of exciting. So, you know, homocystinuria is rare. Um, and yes, this uh, effort is primarily led by HD Network America and HD Network Australia. But what is exciting here is that you can see that we already have a really well representation of, you know, it's a global effort already. Um, and so we have si the 16 participants from six different countries, um, <laughs> didn't count beforehand. Um, but it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, and so, and this is just, this is just the beginning phase. I mean, it's going to be exciting to think about if we continue, you know, at this momentum where we could be in a year. Um, think about what that map essentially could look like, you know, we could have a real global representation of what it looks like for classical HCU, for cobalamin G, for, you know, MTHFR. And, you know, the one thing that I think this will also do is, is show that some of these more rare disorders like MTH, severe MTHFR, and, you know, the co some, some of the more rare cobalamin disorders aren't as rare as, you know, research has been saying. Um, and I think we as, um, an organization know that, and I think Brittany knows that based upon the family she's been able to connect with, but the literature doesn't reflect that. So we need families to participate to, you know, also show to the literature that, you know, these aren't, these figures aren't accurate. There are more of us and, you know, we, we need more help. Um, and the more patients that enroll, that will, that will really help. Um, so this is, pretty exciting. So um, the other thing, um, we mentioned the t-shirt, but if you enroll by May 8th, um, your experience, your data experience will be um, included in our conference, um, which is June 25th and 26th in Bethesda. And so if you fill out the health and development survey, and the next survey is the quality of life, if you have those two completed, then that will help us um, put together a really good presentation for the conference. So we're hoping to have those 50 patients enrolled by May 8th and have those two surveys filled out. Just so wait, so we have a good um, quantity of data to, to work with um, to present. Um, and then at that at the conference, we will be. Um, raffling off a Google Chromebook um, to those who have shared a picture of their dashboard. So uh, we have one to give away. So um, more incentive t-shirts are great. I think people will say, oh, a Chromebook is probably a little better. Uh, and so, uh, but we are so excited, you know, for the data that is coming in, just this data alone right now, showing that, you know, the, the global representation is exciting. So um, let's keep keep the pace up. Let's fill up our little map with the, the little blue men. Um, let's get those 50. Um, so it will be exciting to see where we land at our next Facebook live chat. Um, I am with